Good morning, welcome to worship. At our 1030 service today, we will welcome several new members to Gloria Day. We'll see if we can get some photos to share in the email and on social media so that you can see these new members too. In the adult forum today at 915, we will begin three weeks of dis the discussion of the book, How to Avoid Climate Disaster by Bill Gates. The discussion will be led by fairly new member, Roy Hansen. Check your email for the link or contact doug.brown at Gathered by Grace to get the link and to be added to the email list. The executive committee met last Tuesday. We will continue our present schedule of eight o'clock online only and 1030 in-person parking lot worship through Sunday, October 24th. We turn now to the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like, like lost sheep, sheep, we have gone astray. astray. We, we gaze, gaze upon abundance and empty scarcity. We turn our faces away from, from injustice and oppression. We, we exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Amen. Our gathering hymn is in your bulletin or on page 636 in the hymnal.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with, with you. you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, you. with you. Let us pray. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Share us a gift, share, give us a share of your gift, of your spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading from Numbers 11. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. 
Moses heard the people weeping throughout all their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to, to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all these people alone for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down on a cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord was put his spirit on them. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And from James 5. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter the life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye 
than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We are receiving new members this week, today and next Sunday. Starting my sermon preparations earlier this week, I thought to myself that maybe next time I should check the scripture reading before assigning a date for new members, because surely we could have done better than selecting tear your eye out and cut off your hand and foot Sunday, which is what this second paragraph we just heard, of course, has Jesus telling us we should do if our feet or eyes or hands cause us to sin, which my hands and feet and eyes have done and, of course, will do again. But, darn it, the date was selected and so we are receiving new members today and, well, I don't like to muzzle Jesus even when I want to. So we did hear those verses about tearing out sin-inducing eyes and cutting off sin-inducing hands and feet. But that's in the second paragraph. Let's take a look first at the first paragraph. We'll get to the second. The first paragraph, which follows immediately after last week's gospel reading, which if you were here, you may remember, has Jesus getting into an, Jesus' disciples getting into an argument about which of them was the greatest of them, and the, Jesus then picking up a small child with that child in his lap, said to them that in his kingdom, as opposed to the kingdoms of this world, the greatest are not the power brokers on top of it all, but rather the servants of all. I was thinking of that and got me thinking of all the people who often like to say and post how much they love both Jesus and America. And I love Jesus and America too, to be clear. But you take this following Jesus stuff seriously. And there are times when you can't have it both ways. Because the value system of our dearly beloved and deeply capitalistic society involves a whole lot of history and practice of rising to the top of the greatness ladder at the expense of or on the backs of others, while the value system of the king of kings involves stepping down off that ladder to find greatness in reaching to the needs of others, especially the needs of the world's little ones who don't have what they need, and in doing so, in drawing near to them, you will actually, Jesus said, find yourself drawing near to him. The one who climbed down the greatest ladder there is, the stairway to heaven, if you will, to meet us in the depth of our need by being lifted up not to a penthouse suite, but to a cross. Take this following Jesus stuff dead seriously as he did. And there will be times when we can't have it both ways. Moments when we have to make a decision. And what we do then is what reveals then who or what is in fact our truest love. It is right immediately after that upside downing of the value system of not just our country, but of the world that our text for today picks right up again, which means that Jesus has just stopped talking, which means that I'm thinking that child is still on his lap when John jumps in with a childish combination of tattling and bragging. Teacher, he says, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. John, in this case, is, of course, serving as a spokesperson for the ever-present, it seems, uh, Charlie Brown wing of Jesus' followers then and now, because though the teacher has been teaching, what John and the others have apparently been hearing, hearing is what? Wah, 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 right? Because here we go again with Jesus' followers once again, not even on the same planet that Jesus has been talking about, which I suppose shouldn't be all that surprising, because, of course, they're from our planet. 
where the world is divided into those who are us and those who aren't us, those who are them. Then them's fighting words, right? I kind of want to picture this point in the scene with Jesus rolling his eyes like I would have. But I'm probably pretty sure he didn't. But what he did do is tell John and the others that though people have, not just along religious lines, but along political and, and patriotic and cultural and racial lines, turned God's world, in God's good world, into the world we live in, this world with almost nothing but anymore us's and them's mad at each other and hating each other, that is not the world God means God's world to be. For God's good world is a place where we realize that all who do good may not be one of us, but they are one with us and one with God for good, true good. All, God, all good is of God. And therefore, good is always a good thing no matter who does it. Good is a good thing in God's eyes even when people who don't believe in God do it. Anybody who does anything that Christ would call good in that moment is not our enemy but our partner. And that's true in that moment even if they're from that other political party, even if they watch that other news channel, even if they think some things that I don't agree with at all, even if for that matter I really don't like them at all. And even for that matter, if they do the good things they do, not believing in Jesus at all. Which is to say that if anyone at all does something Jesus would call good, they are in that moment anyway, at the very least, someone to be cheered on. Perhaps even someone Jesus might in fact want you to consider joining hands with for good. Who knows, before you know it, a relationship might develop. And in my experience, once actual relationships get going, you might at some point find yourself sharing some stories that are good, including you listening to their story, and you too, when the timing is right, maybe even sharing just a portion of your story of how good for you is the goodness and grace of Jesus. Pastor Sarah and I were eating outdoors this week at a downtown restaurant I've not yet ventured back into indoor dining, but where our server was a young woman, early 20s maybe. When she handed me the check, I said to her, I notice you have, I notice you have a cross tattooed on your finger. She said, yeah, I have another one too, and she lifted up her right foot and showed us her right ankle, where was found in, in ink a far more substantial cross, at the base of which were what she pointed out were roots going down. Pastor Sarah said, can you tell me more about that? She said, I was raised in the church, but when I was 16, I told God goodbye. Her voice got softer. It didn't go well, she said. In a lot of ways, she said. Including addiction, she said. It was hell, she said. And there in hell, she said, was the cross. Reaching to me, even though I turned my back to it. And I'm back in the church again, she said. And I've got roots again, she said. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, she said. I have various reasons for sometimes giving a server a higher than normal tip. This was the first time the reason was the tear in my eye and the joy in my heart as I listened to this young woman speak with such quiet but simultaneously passionate love for my Jesus and his saving and amazing grace. And she wasn't even Lutheran. <laughs> I even kind of got the idea from a phrase she used or two that she might even be one of them, those whose theology I don't like. Let me tell you something clearly. Of course, theology has its place, its important place for sure. But that shirt she was talking about helped her rediscover her place in the arms and in the plans and purposes of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, with the saints and angels in heaven and with Jesus, would you please join me in giving her and her church a round of applause?
All right, now I want you to keep that young woman in mind as we move on to the next paragraph. And I also want you to keep another woman in mind, that woman being a friend of my daughter's, who is uh, one of the PGA professional golf instructors at the Cedar Rapids Country Club, and in my daughter's opinion, there's not a better one in the world. So, since my golf game could always stand to get better, I took a couple lessons a few weeks ago. We finished the second lesson by working on my short game, which is what golfers use that phrase, your short game, to refer to the, the shots that you hit when you're getting closer to the green and closer to the hole. She, she dropped, a, you don't, you don't need, a, you don't need a, a big full swing at that point. You need to have kind of an accurate short swing. She dropped a few balls a few yards from the practice screen. She said to me, let me watch you hit a few from here. I showed her a few. She said, okay, this is an easy fix. I said, really? Good. What is it? She said, yep, all we have to do is cut off your hands. <laughs> <clears throat> now, you don't need to be a golfer, but in a, in a full swing, there's a point where your hands kind of kind of break, they snap, and that generates more speed, and that generates more distance as you hit the ball. But what she was saying is that around the green, you've got to not do that. I'm standing here and trying to hit a short shot by going, it, it's really hard to control. She wants me, if you will, to keep the hands out of it and do this kind of a thing, cutting off my hands. We can agree, of course, uh, that she was not speaking literally, but hyperbolically, exaggeratedly, as a way of making her point very memorably. I imagine you might memorize, remember, remember her point, even if you're not a golfer. But though, of course, she wasn't speaking literally, the point she was making was nevertheless literal. <laughs> My hands literally were causing a problem. And if I was serious about improving my short game, that had to change. To Mark 8.42, where Jesus, a little child still on his lap, says to his followers, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea to die. Can we agree that Jesus is not here speaking literally, but rather hyperbolically, exaggeratedly, as a way of making his point very memorably? But though, of course, he wasn't speaking literally, the point he is here making, nevertheless, is literal. That point being, that faith being, one of the greatest things there are in this life, the other two things being hope and love, lovingly to help someone in their journey of faith is as great as it gets in the kingdom of God. But on the flip side, causing the young in faith or the new in faith or someone who is seeking faith, causing them to stumble from the faith is as serious as life and death. I think of all the stumbling blocks, and on some of these, I have to be honest, I have at times been on the wrong side of the matter, been the wrong side of the stumbling block. Stumbling blocks that have been thrown, for example, at over the years or in front of over the years, our LGBTQ neighbors and their journeys of faith, or stumbling blocks thrown at or in front of people whose particular sins have been dubbed by church people as more serious than what we consider to be our relatively minor sins, or the heinous stumbling blocks that have been thrown at or in front of children by those who, from positions of power and trust in Christ's church, have used or abused them, or to, even more these days, the stumbling blocks thrown at or in front of people when Christians or churches or denominations vocally, vocally and vehemently yoke themselves to politicians and political movements which are oh so driven by fear and hate and untruth with the result that those who are by these churches and their leaders feared and hated are essentially being stoned with the message that the truth is that the one they are really hated by is God. I could go on, I'm sure you could too, but surely the point is made 
Jesus doesn't want us throwing ourselves or anyone off of bridges with heavy weights around our necks to die, but he is deadly serious about the seriousness of helping people, not hindering people in their journey of faith with and toward the one whose journey took him on that journey from heaven's throne to Calvary's cross for all of us sinners. Which takes us to the again, of course, not literal, but hyperbolically exaggerated ensuing verses where Jesus says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Of course, hyperbolic, exaggerated for effect, not to be taken literally. But once again beneath it is a literal point, meant to be taken absolutely seriously, a point a young woman who served lunch to Pastor Sarah and me told us she discovered to be true, quite literally. That truth being that life without God is hell. Indeed, whatever in the end hell is, wherever in the end hell is, and whoever in the end is in it, and that's a topic for a whole another sermon, I'm convinced that what makes hell, hell, is the fact that hell is where God literally isn't. Though in speaking these harsh and hard words, it is oh so important to remember, is speaking in them on the way to Jerusalem and its cross, where not ours but his will be the hands and feet bloodied. And his will be the eyes looking upon all the fear and hate and sin of the world. Where his then will be the prayer, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And from that cross, his would be the journey to hell and back so that sinners our sins taken from us upon his back by grace through faith might rise with him as citizens ultimately not of any kingdom of this world, but of the kingdom of God, alive and at work here and now in this world, among God's own until that day when all will rise to see with their eyes the coming of a new heaven and a new earth, all now at long last encompassed by the good and gracious kingdom of the King of Love, prepared for forever, for God's own. All of them. Amen. The hymn of the day is number 669 or printed in your bulletins.
made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you bring your people together in worship. Enliven your church. May we proclaim the gospel of peace and share your loving word with our weary world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Creative God, we pray for the earth. Bless all who advocate for healthy forests, unpolluted air, and clean waterways. Inspire all people to show care for the world you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Sovereign God, we pray for the nations of the world, for governments, <coughs> leaders, and citizens. Raise up prophets and leaders to proclaim your way of justice. Provide for the needs of refugees, immigrants, asylum seekers, and exiles. Sustain your people through uncertain and unstable times. Encourage leaders and governments to work with one another for the good of our common world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Merciful God, we pray for people living in drought-stricken lands and for those facing wildfires. Look with mercy on those who are displaced by storms and floodwaters. Give them courage to meet the days ahead. Grant strength and endurance to all those who aid in recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Compassionate God, send your comfort to those in need. Give your peace to the friends and families of Ruth Pearson, Don Rossback, and Donna Hocken. We pray for John, Jean, Terry, Ellen, Chris, and David, for all who are homebound, and for families and friends who need your healing, especially those we name now before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Welcoming God at tables around the world through story and meal, Strangers becomes guests and guests become friends. We pray that this congregation will always extend the welcome that you extend to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember the cloud of witnesses whose lives inspire us to loving service. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them, them to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give, give our thanks, thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Make us bold, O merciful God, to address you as our Abba, as we pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your, your will be done, done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. us. Save, Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst come, the table is ready. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God.
body of Christ given for you, Kathy. Blood of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you, David. Christ given for you. Amen. Christ shed for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body bringing life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you, now and forever. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 551, or printed in your bulletin.
in you. Thanks be to God.